Martina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for making some time. I know you're a very, very busy woman. You're what I would say, you know, kind of like a success story of uh, any immigrant com coming to America. How uh, trite would it sound? But no matter how trite it would sound, but American dream probably can apply to you. Oh, that's that's very sweet of you to say. It's, it's hard for me to say the same about me because it sounds cocky if somebody talks about themselves that way. So I try to keep it humble. But, you know, I'm grateful this country has been good to me. Martina, let's start from the beginning. So uh, first and foremost, uh, you apply well to my like original idea of my show. You're a metalhead and you grew up in a country of... Bulgaria. Da. How do you say correctly in Bulgarian? Bulgaria? Bulgaria. Da. Bulgaria. Okay. You speak, a, you, you understand a little Russian even, right? Yeah, but I'm a little bit not very good. Not very good. Okay. But I can make my way. Uh, vodka. Vodka, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Vodka. And then you go. And then I'm good. So uh, what was it? We'll get to all of these things. So um, you are a metalhead first. Then you, or, you know, came to America. You started covering like shows and stuff. You did a lot of like video and journalism kind of journalist kind of work where you, you were covering all kinds of events. You uh, wrote a book, which I want to hear about. By the way, uh, you brought it today. Thank you for the great <laughs> gift. Uh, it's in Bulgarian. and I can't really read it, but, you know, it's fun. Um, We'll talk about that. And then you do, uh, uh, you're in this crazy world of real estate. I don't know how you do all this and juggle it all together where, you know, um, I want to know all about it. Okay. So where do I start? Okay. Let's uh, start with the basics. Let's go, let's go back to Bulgaria. And uh, uh, how was it? How was the metal scene there? How'd you get even into metal back there? So... The hardcore scene has always been very active in Bulgaria. I'm actually wearing today a t-shirt of one of my favorite uh, hardcore, it's a beatdown hardcore bands called Redown. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I, I was just in Bulgaria two weeks ago and I was greeted with a great show was organized by my friend Alex with Last Hope and Redown was there. There was two other bands that I haven't heard before, Expectations and Pustuta, and it was a great show. It was outside, outdoors, and like old railroad tracks. It was really nice. The scene is very active. So I actually, I grew up listening to a lot of, uh, when I was 13, 14, I thought it's really cool. Like I was like the underground scene and, you know, baggy clothes and the look and the subculture and all that. So um, back then in Plovdiv, I'm from Plovdiv, Bulgaria, by the way which is the second biggest city, it has a population of about 500,000 people right now. So the scene was there were a, lo a lot of hardcore shows and there were also a lot of reggae parties. So reggae and raga parties and hip hop. So I uh, grew up going to a lot of this when I was 13, 14. Thankfully, they allowed us in the bars and in the clubs back then. So, you know, we could all go and... Um, and yeah, so, so I started going to a lot of shows and then how I got into metal, well, I'm from that generation that uh, new metal came in. So that's something that uh, I'm not ashamed to say it, no, but I, <laughs> that yeah. I really liked Linkin Park when I was 13 years old. So Linkin Park was really, uh, it was really my way into that music. And then from there, um, I got into Korn, I got into other bands and back then, what, what is the prototype of Spotify and, uh, you know, Pandora and a lot of different radios was back then Yahoo Lounge. I don't know if you remember Yahoo Lounge. So it was like an online radio. And when you like somebody, you vote if you like them or not. And then it gives you recommendations for other bands that they think you may like. And then when you vote for them, they actually kind of adjust to your music taste. So that introduced me to a lot of like goth music because I also grew, uh, you know, a lot into the goth scene. So that introduced me to like Bauhaus, Susie and the Banshees, some like, uh, you know, I slowly got into more heavier metal, you know, like uh, from corn, you know, hardcore, then more like crossover stuff, thrash, you know, black metal, that metal, like Demo Burger, Crowd of Filth, stuff like this. So that really got me into this. And then I had a period when I was really into electronic music as well. Uh, you know, techno, hard techno. There were a lot of hard techno parties in Bulgaria. That was really fun. Like DJ Rush, uh, you know, Carol Cox. Carol Cox is playing, by the way, in October, New York. So Here. that's going to wow. be really awesome. Um, 
So, so yeah. And then after that, I kind of like all these music styles that I've liked kind of blended into my own taste. And I was really also into Last Femme, which is another, it's not that active right now, but um, I met some really awesome people. Actually, the reason my friend Antonio, who's the reason why I'm in New York, we met through Last FM because he was in Sofia by himself and that uh, he saw that I attended the Massive Attack show and he was like, help, I'm here a month. I don't know nobody. I'm bored out of my mind. And it ended up that we um, both won green cards. We actually met. I brought a friend with me because I was like, I didn't know if he's a serial killer or anything. <laughs> And uh, it ended up that he won a green card and then my mom won a green card the same year. So I was um, first in South Jersey around Atlantic City and I really hated it. And I was, uh, if I had to stay there, I was probably going to go back to Bulgaria because uh, you no, know, I had a good life in Bulgaria. Uh, my background's in journalism. So at that point I was studying journalism in Sofia University and, um, you know, I was uh, working for the big, uh, for the Bulgarian news agency, I actually did internship there. And then I started doing financial journalism, outsourcing for Dow Jones. I was 19, 20 at the point at that time from French, because I was in French high school. So I would speak French and, uh, yeah, I didn't really didn't like it in South Jersey. And I was, uh, I spoke to him and he was like, listen, don't waste your time. I couldn't find no job there. That was right before the casinos crashed. Like, don't waste your time. Come to New York. So I told my mom, I was like, listen, I'm, I packed my bag and I was like, I'm going to New York. If you want to come. How old were you by then? I was like, you were I was 20, 21. 21. I came, I got the last train to uh, citizenship because after 21, then your parents can give it to Same you. Same thing happened with me, by the oh, way. Oh, yeah? yeah? I came, That's I was awesome. 20, six months before I turned 21. We were approved. My mom was approved. Yeah. So very yeah. similar story. Yeah. Crazy. And yeah. So uh, then I came to New York. No, she said... Okay, wait. And she packed her back with me. And we told the people we were staying with, we were with two big suitcases. We were like, oh, yeah, we're going to check New York. And then we found a place that um, um, you could stay just the weekly. It was in bed And that was like bed 10 years ago, right across from Marcy Projects. And I was walking around. I was like, oh, that must be a nice building because it has a children's playground about Marcy Projects. <laughs> but anyway, mm, you know, I ended up here. I, I found the job for as a sales associate right across from the Empire State Building um, for $9 an hour, which I quickly realized I can make me nothing. But I had a job, you know, we had a place to stay. So um, then I became a bartender because I was like, I can't sustain myself with this money after they take your taxes and everything. Even if staying in a room, and it was hard because it was me and my mom in a room and uh, in one room. And, you know, got a little tense. So it was not a lot of um, per personal space. It was a two-bedroom. There was two other girls, a girl and her sister in the other room. And there was a guy sleeping on the couch. So these were the first, you know, the first immigrant years in New York. Not years. That was like a few months. And then um, me and my mom moved to different places, which was one of the best decisions. I love my mom. But, you know, I feel after a certain age, it's good to be... Uh, yeah. Uh, so really quick. Yes. I'm just curious about uh, like socially, what does it mean to be a metalhead in Bulgaria? I'm just curious. I'm trying to draw some parallels between Azerbaijan and Bulgaria. Bulgaria is more, it's the classic Eastern European place, which is kind of, you know, I feel like probably was more open to music like that. Like in Azerbaijan, you know, uh, to everything. Plus it's a Muslim country. There's a little bit more oomph to the, you know, toughness to be a metalhead, especially back then, like mid 2000s when it was all coming around. Mm -hmm. what, did, what did it mean socially to be a metalhead in Bulgaria? I always thought it's cool. And then we had like, we had the traditional metalheads, which were, you know, with the mesh in the back, like long, ha long hair and like a, you know, Man War t-shirt. And we had a very quintessential concert, 19, I think it was 1998 Metallica in my hometown Plovdiv. Wow. It was huge. I was eight years old only then, so I didn't go, but I remember it very well. Um, and then, you know, it was one of the one of the more well known subcultures. I don't know if necessarily it was cool because I never really cared about the mainstream idea of cool. I always like, you know, the little edgy things. But um 
yeah, after that, it you know the hardcore scene is different. I I also I go I grew a lot into like the hardcore punk scene, metal. But because we're not that many people, we end up like oh like hanging and hanging out together. When I moved to Sofia to study, um, I started going out with a lot of the goth kids there, and they're not. We're talking about maybe like a hundred, hundred and fifty people total. Uh, so it wasn't that huge. So we had like. You know, small concerts, not too many people, but like really nice people. And uh, I'm still in touch with all my friends from like 15, 20 years ago. So I don't know if that re- that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I just wanted to try to get a feel of what's going on there. It's a cool, it's it's a cool scene. Like it's very, uh, you know, uh, I guess it's active. Like the bands don't really release that much new things. I feel that sometimes you know, people tend to get a little more comfortable and not that driven to do things. But they are there are bands who are really like big driving forces of the scene. Like, as I said, Last Hope are very well known. We have some super bands with the US. I usually go home for Christmas and every year there is a hardcore Christmas show, um, which is, you know, unites a lot of like the hardcore bands and... Uh, I guess th- there are like uh, there are also metal bands in Bulgaria, um, but more like kind of like it's like I feel the hardcore scene is stronger than the metal than the metal scene about local bands about like touring bands. We get a lot of these bands that are kind of old now and they're touring at places that are not that well known. So we get like a million shows of Nightwish and we get Manowar and White Snake and everybody who've kind of like retired and stuff. But the good thing and what I really love about it and what really surprised me when I came to New York is that we really give our heart and soul into the shows. Like everybody jumps and moshes and goes crazy. And here in New York, we were a little spoiled. So everybody, you know, would be like standing because we get the cure on a Tuesday night. And it's like, okay, just another show. Now after COVID, when shows are restarting, uh, I think things are going to change, probably. I'm actually going to a show later tonight at Aragon Swine in Bushwick. It's going to be a bunch of like local bands. And there is a touring band from Colombia that I don't know which one it is. But, uh, I mean, for me, the uh, just the line that you guys had Metallica on in 1998, that kind of says it all. Like, I remember the biggest thing that ever appeared on our scene was Elton John in like 2000, like seven or something and everybody lost their shit everybody was like this is the coolest thing ever people who know who elton john is who don't know who elton john is everybody went and uh that's it so that's kind of describes the scene in the 90s and 2000s after soviet union collapsed we were just so um basically uh desperate for anything and definitely music wasn't you know uh on top priority to uh you know to put things you know back together uh, so yeah, for me, I could have only like wish to see bands like that. And I remember when I came here, I just first few years, I just consumed uh, shows and would go to every show I can just by myself. I don't have any like metal friends and I still don't really you know you, a couple other people, well, that's it. But that that was crazy. I would go to like see Arch Enemy, Cannibal Corpse, D-Side, you know, Behemoth like three times, you know, Rammstein, this, that. Uh, and and then you get spoiled. Then I see a Devil Driver, whatever. I don't care about <laughs> Devil Driver. It's like... What did we see together at the Best uh, Buy Theater? I it was, was Cannibal Corpse yes. and... Uh, and there was a, another and, and Morbid Angel. Really? Yeah. You saw Morbid Angel together? Yeah, I think so. Because uh, you know that I had also, uh, it's kind of in hiatus now, but I had a music blog that was... Uh, yeah, I remember. Right, right, right. You yeah, wrote about that. Yeah, flowersinagun.com. I think I, I I never uploaded the pictures from that show. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm not sure. Maybe I did. I mean, the blog is still active. People can check it out. There's a lot of like cool archives of cool, uh, you know, pictures because I used to get the photo pass. I'll go for free and also I'll get, you know, the pass to go right in front. And I really enjoy taking pictures of bands and videos and I'm you know really into music I used to cover metal shows in Bulgaria in my student years and I remember because the thing about me is that you know kind of like at least in Bulgaria when you're a girl in the metal scene was expected for me to just have a metal t-shirt and I have a, I have you know a hardcore t-shirt right now and you know just baggy pants and stuff but I like to show up with a little dress or like pigtails and I would cover like I would show to a black metal show intentionally with like pigtails and like a Hello Kitty a note notebook and a B pen and stuff 
and just destroy the show. So like, cause it was boring. And like this, I remember it was Vatain. I don't know, do you know that yeah, band yeah, yeah. Vatain? So they brought a pig hat on stage. Oh, right, but right, But the pig right. hat was from two weeks ago. So it smelled horrible. And I spoke with the tour manager and he was like, I was like, why does it smell so bad? He's like, they haven't changed the pig hat. I'm like, just like get a different pig hat. Is it that difficult? So I wrote about that and I almost fell asleep. So I wrote like a very honest and blunt review. Because, you know, I'm like, yeah. that, I'm, that's my personality and stuff. I'm like, you know, you're not paying me for PR. You're just getting me a free ticket. I write whatever I want. And then they would call the next, and be like, don't send this girl anymore. And then the the media, which was the biggest, like, metal, metal media in Bulgaria back then, Metal Catechesis, they would come with a with a article that, uh, with a statement that they're not going to cover underground shows anymore. So I made this, like, big scandal and stuff. I was really enjoying it, you know. Well, you basically were rebelling inside of a very rebellious culture like. yeah i was rebelling like my mom she was a big rebel also like growing up and stuff so i think it runs in my blood but uh, i like to you know i like to and now that thing have changed more because i see that uh you know the stereotypes that you have to look a certain way to blend into a certain subculture are changing i was talking with my friend who's a hip-hop uh, dj and artist in bulgaria mit kuhiwa in Plovdiv, and he in Plovdiv in my hometown, and he was saying that I'm looking, and there is this guy, and he looks like a metalhead in the back, and then he turns, and in the front he looks like a rapper, and I'm so confused: is he a metalhead? Is he a rapper? So the new generation, like things are kind of, and especially the newer than me, because we're you know we're in our thirties now, we're yeah, not that yeah, young yeah. anymore. Um, are are very like different, and uh, they're different like cultures and subcultures and things that people are into. Um, well, I've always found that kind of annoying. Once, uh, you ever seen the movie Lobster? No, but I like lobster. You like lobsters? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a good movie. You should check it out. So I wouldn't like make that as an example, but uh, like we join this subculture because we don't like the uh, what the popular society the social standards are right you're supposed to wear this a girl's supposed to wear this a guy's supposed to behave like this and we're like fuck it i'm a guy i'm gonna get long hair i'm gonna wear this leather jacket i'm gonna go crazy right then you join that subculture and it becomes this uh, uh, elitism starts there where it's like well are you a metal a black metal head or are you death metal? because you shouldn't wear this if you're a death metal like yeah. And it's like, all right, like, shut the fuck up. Like, I can wear whatever, whatever the fuck I want, and uh, I don't have to, you know, like, be either. I can just wear whatever I want. I can listen to whatever I want. And I always found that a little annoying once I hear some, you know, people start, I don't know, telling you what to do inside of the culture that's supposed to be all accepting. Exactly. And and that's what I like to say, that if you're tolerant, you got to be tolerant all around the spectrum. You can be selectively tolerant. Oh, I tolerate this and this and that. And no, I don't want to touch that topic too much, but, uh, you know, I'm a little worried that we're turning into a very totalitarian uh, society where people are very divided and they're like, oh, if you don't do that, if you're not like me, you're not, you know, uh, gonna be... uh, accept it or you can't go to public places if you don't take this product from big pharma and stuff which uh, i find very un-american uh so uh things are and you know you can't play in shows and that's like you know offsprings uh drummer had to quit the band because he has a medical condition that prevents him to get vaccinated and he you know he doesn't want to risk his life and they're like oh, i okay, didn't hear about that yeah, yeah it's all over the news it was i read about it on pitchfork so i had to quit the band so for cultures that always been very counter culture now becoming more of the status quo for me is very strange and you know we are coming especially from us we're coming from a totalitarian uh, regime or at least we've seen the product of it because i'm born 1990 and communism fell 1989 in bulgaria but I've learned a lot of stories from my mom and, uh, you know, how restrictive people thinks, you know, things can be. And I know your next guest is somebody I know, uh, AJ, who's actually, he's from Bosnia and he's very communist. Bosnia, views. Right, right, my right, views yeah. are very like anarchy, libertarian, government, leave me alone, let me do my thing. Uh, yeah, I'm with you. I, I'm, I feel, you know, I uh, believe in the same thing. I'm more libertarian, even though people hate that word now. They make it sound like an evil thing to say. I don't care. Uh, yeah, but it's definitely for me, as as you said, like I saw the product of 
you know, uh, communism. And I read a lot about it and I uh, just see what happened, you know, and our parents have become almost uh, uh, like they're the not the victims, they're sacrificed that had to be taken for the communism to fall. But they kind of, you know, ate shit. A lot of like our parents, because all factories, everything has been closed, everything, everybody, everybody lost their jobs, you know, that they have supposed to had for years to come. And there was nothing to work on. All the engineers, all the uh, doctors maybe survived, but like uh, a lot of tech jobs and uh, architects or, uh, architects and stuff, they all kind of, you know, went under. Uh, who who was able to flee, they flee, you know, but a lot of people stayed and uh, ate shit in the 90s. That's why 90s were very brutal in all former post-Soviet Union, I'm pretty sure in Eastern Europe. Well, you got the all the Yugoslavia, you know, bullshit, you know, in the '90s. So the '90s were uh, ruthless in the wow. East, rough. Very shady years. She very shady years. Um, but I definitely see the patterns now too. Uh, for me, they're uh, let me say it in, in Russian. Let's see if you shita belimi nitkami, like they sew it with white thread. You know, you just see it. It's obvious. Yeah, you yeah. Know, you see the... Bialkunets. Oh, here you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just too obvious to me. And I'm like, how is this ever anybody else seeing that this is like evil? Um, I actually uh, read this uh, uh, Pritcha. Do you say Pritcha? Pritcha, yeah, like, yeah. Pritcha, they don't yeah. Have, I don't know in English. There's an anecdote, that moral anecdote. I don't yeah, know. yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. I know. I know what it is. I don't know if the viewers would be, but they yeah. can Google it. People, and people find would out. know, yeah. Pritcha, they would know. Most of my people watching, they're like Russian speaking, so they'll figure it out. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but here's one for you, and I think it'll, it'll like put like a nice uh, uh, point, you know, period in this uh, topic. But. Um, so it's, it's a preach about a devil and a horse, right? The devil lets the horse free, right? There's a horse that attached day and night and devil lets it free. The horse goes to the neighboring house, takes a poop there. The horse gets shot by the owner of the house. Then the owner of the horse comes and says, what the fuck did you do to my horse? And shoots the guy. Now, the guy's brother comes, say, why the fuck did you shoot my brother? And shoots this guy. Now, this guy's uncle comes and shoots that guy. And it goes back and forward, this feud between this family. And finally, it gets to the point where uh, the city shoots both of these uh, families and gets rid of them, right? And then they ask the devil, why did you do this thing? He said, I didn't do anything wrong. I just let the horse free. Right. So I think there's a lot of this kind of culture where people think this is the right thing to do, but they don't realize there's it comes with a lot of backfire. It come, It's not that black and white. You can fix this. Yeah, it's the right thing to do. Let's say to do this. But it comes with its consequences that are going to uh, kick you in the balls, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 20 years. So we have to very tread very carefully. It's just I feel that everybody should have a personal choice of what to do with their body. And I think that that should apply to everything and uh you know i am not anti anything i am pro people being free to make choices about their you know flesh and their soul and and uh and not attack other people because you know your truth is your truth somebody else's truth may be very different you know and uh especially like you know my background's working in media i've been a journalist news journalist for over 10 years and um I feel that media have escalated and have changed a lot since the days when I wanted to join media because, you know, from reasons that, you know, there were not a money because nobody becomes a journalist because they want to be a millionaire usually, you know. But things have changed a lot and, you know, um, money talks and money pays and plays. Yeah. And uh, it's important for people to check multiple sources and to think more than just consume, because I feel that with social media and, you know, we've, we're conditioned to have the attention span of a golden retriever right now. So nobody really can read more than five lines, you know, or like everything needs to be truth and given to you. And, you know, just you're, we're just blasted for, with information from everywhere. And uh, it's hard to um, sometimes differentiate things and... Uh, it's easy to fall into a narrative that's, uh, you know, deceiving one way or another. 
And that's why it's important, you know, as a journalist, you check you check multiple sources and then you make your own decisions for yourselves. And hopefully we're gonna, you know, America has been a good country because it have allowed personal freedom and, you know, no regime is perfect. But I still feel that, uh, you know, America has been good to me. And of course it has its flaws and, uh, you know, its problems like every country does, but uh, it have given people an opportunity to, to make the best out of their lives. And especially New York is a type of a city that I feel if you're working hard and you're willing to put the hours and you're willing to, you know, put your ego behind and just, you know, focus on what you do, there are ways to do it. Like people really accept you here you can come from Azerbaijan, you can come from Pakistan, you can come from China, you can come from Bulgaria, you can come from Mozambique, you can come from, come from everywhere, and you can, you're still allowed to prove yourself. While you, when you go to Europe, like Western Europe, and you are from Eastern Europe, there is definitely a little bit more stigma about you, that here, that doesn't exist. Here's like, oh, what, oh my God, you're from Bulgaria, that's so cool, that's so exotic, that's so this and that. So, uh, you know, I think that's something that. Hopefully, I hope that will be preserved in this country. Would let let still people, um, you know, be more, you know, on their own path than just following the same path that everybody needs to go to because somebody decides. Tell me about your book. When did you write it? What made you write it? And how it got you know made into reality? Because I saw even a couple of videos. You've been on Bulgarian TV presenting your book. Tell me a little bit. Yeah, so um, I, the book that I wrote is actually the first uh, S&M novel in Bulgaria. So um, it's cyberpunk erotica. The name is Samuta, or Alone in English. I started it when I was 18 years old in uh, Tunisia, way before Fifty Shades of Grey were even a thing. And then it took me um, seven years to write it, actually. And um, yeah, it's like it's, it's about a girl that's locked in... It's, she gets locked in a room when there is nothing but her computer and she has to make people on the social network called Image Box commit suicide so they live forever on the internet. And if she makes, she convinces three people uh, to uh, die so they can be completely free and get rid of all their, you know, human uh, pains and problems and just evolve and migrate their soul to the internet, then she'll be free. And there is a guy who's called Gabriel, like the angel Gabriel, who talks to her through the computer. But every night when she falls asleep, there is another girl who's uh, who's called Valeria. And she has two masters, and she's really into S&M, and she likes uh, getting spanked and all that. So, uh, so she starts telling her story in her dreams, and, um, you know, eventually becomes a key of, Maybe her getting out. I don't know. I don't want to reveal too much. Sure. But um, yeah, the, the book did very well. I decided that um, when Fifty Shades of Grey, the movie was coming out, my my roommate back in the days, Teo Chepiov, he was a Bulgarian screenwriter and he moved to New York briefly. So um, I was like, you know, that's a perfect moment. Let's ride that train. And I decided to self-publish it because I had, uh, I was like, I'm going to either go with the two biggest publishing house or I'm going to go by myself. Uh, and one of them wanted to publish it online, which was not my vision. And then the second one uh, wanted to just tell me, oh, you're a continue writing. You're an ambitious young girl, which I did not ask opinion about, you know, who I am as a girl. I am, I, you know, just had a business proposal, which is a simple yes or no. So anyway, I think it worked for the best because I got, a, and you can show a, a, maybe, you know, when you edit the cover of the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, was done by Alex Ramirez. She's a Bulgarian uh, painter and illustrator. She actually uh, got very uh, good uh, gigs now and like her career is going up a lot. She's a very dear friend of mine. She's in London. So uh, she did the cover and then I got my own PR. I financed the whole project myself and uh, it did really well. We were I was on all the TVs because at that time I was a reporter for the biggest TV in Bulgaria. So I was very active, like news reporter for the biggest news um you know, news, it wasn't a news channel, it's a national TV, but they're news. So it was kind of a tricky because I had to, you know, publish a very edgy book with very explicit sex scenes and still be, you know, hi, I'm from New York, corresponding Martina Dechevska, but we did very well. The presentation in uh, Plus Tuva in Sofia had like people outside and uh, uh, it made it to like covers of uh, newspapers, which I think was a big success for an independent product. 
because I wanted to really show that an independent artist can come and have his own, you know, artistic vision being presented without having to depend on, you know, a big publishing house and make it. And after that, after I got my money back, I've been donating everything to charity. So I wanted the most perverse book to go for the biggest perversion in our society, which I think is uh, the state of uh, Bulgarian retired people because they have to live. I don't know how is it in Azerbaijan, but in Bulgaria, they have to live with like $200 or less. And a lot of them are... It's the same. Yeah, it's not great. Left in the mountains and there are people who go rob their houses and like kill them and there's really no justice and stuff. So I partner up with an organization that uh, they go and they buy uh, products and for Easter and for, for Christmas, they go and they bring them to old people in the mountains. So... It was a very conceptual project. Like I like to say, it's like my first child. So I'm happy of what happened with it. Like it was harder, of course, because I decided not to go at a publishing house. I actually had a foundation here that refused translators to even apply for their programs with my book because it's not published by publishing house. And then my distribution didn't really do a lot. Uh, but I gave the book to all the libraries. So now you can go and you could get it in the library for free. So it was really not a, it wasn't a money venture. It was like, you know, there are things we do for money and things we do for love. That's definitely something I did for love. I still want to publish it in the U.S. You actually know that uh, I sent you a while ago yeah. uh, my book, but you didn't you didn't read it yet, which is okay. You I, read I, some I, re- of I read it. like 30 or 40%. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, no, That's I read nice. quite some, yeah. It's not fresh in my memory, but you know, I was quite entertained. Ah, that's good. It was, good. Uh, you know, but it, 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 it was edgy even for me. I was like, oh, is anybody watching me? Like, <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah, it's a little, it's a little, uh, it's a little hard. But uh, my question is, what was it a controversial at any point when you would present it in Bulgaria? I feel that Bulgaria, like things, are very sexualized already, and my inspiration to that book co- came. Uh, Right after communism fell, all the you know S and M classics like we're talking about Story of O, Marquis du Sade, um, you know Zahir Mazok, Venus in First, they were all published because there was such a big craving for um, for the forbidden, right, and the sexual and stuff. They were all published in like a really crazy big, um, you know, how do you call it in English? Issues, like right issue, like you know, like big, big numbers of books were published and, um, and, and yeah, and, and they were in these cheap paperbacks with a naked woman in the front. And I started collecting them because I thought they're really cool and it's a cool edition. And I like that, uh, you know, where, where the artsy meets the pulp fiction and the cheap. So I like to play with the you know, terms like I don't like, like in Bulgaria, like sometimes, and I don't know how it is in Azerbaijan, like, but sometimes people take themselves too serious that they're too artsy and they're just too above these things and elitist. I like to play with the high and the low, with the cheap and the expensive, with that that thing. So that was like a big, big inspiration. And then, you know, we are very sexualized culture, like the age of consent in Bulgaria is 14. And there's two people, there's two, uh, People are selling brides, like gypsies in Bulgaria. They're selling, you know, for a thousand level, you get a 12, 13 year old bride. Like, you know, it's crazy. Like, wow. this, things like that sound insane here. But in Bulgaria, 14, 15 year old, your boyfriend's 25. That's kind of like, you know, socially accepted and stuff. And it's legal. So, uh, and, and then all our advertising is also with like, you know, sex, a lot of it. And then we also have this chauga which I really don't like, but, you know, your next guest probably likes it. They have this subculture, Chauga, that is this, um, you know, women that, you know, plastic surgery, very skunkly dressed. The uh, videos look like soft porn sometimes. So, um, you know, I don't think it was that shocking. And I kind of like kept it underground. I guess like some of the sex scenes are definitely some of the most brutal sex scenes that have been if not the most brutal published in Bulgaria. But I also, I am a big fan of female erotica and I like you know, and it's mean, and like I feel that when women write erotica, they put a different sense of sensibility in it, and it's it's also it's not all about the sex. Like a lot of it's about like positive thinking and the power of mind and how you can actually change your the direction of your life with your thoughts. So that's in the middle of it. I feel it was it became a complex book. I really want to publish it in the U.S. I was making efforts. It's tough uh, when you're uh, not a native speaker. Because it's always been like tough for me to make 
you know, should I continue writing in English, uh, in Bulgarian? Should I start writing in English? Like, I want to, I start the next novel. And then it's like always the question, should I write in English or in Bulgarian? It's always the feeling as a writer that since you're not a native speaker, even if you've lived in a country for so long, you're never going to be, you know, have that same feeling to the language that a native speaker does. Mm. So it's a little bit of, you know, it's a, a little bit of a, struggle but i feel that you know i like to have that outlook that whatever's best is gonna happen so i'm hustling real estate right now and i'm trying to you know make time so my dream is you know whenever the time comes i'll be sitting on a beach uh, with uh you know the person i love and uh and write and have time to write my novel so then maybe my novel will come out then or maybe I'll find a publisher now. Somebody hears your podcast. They're like, oh, Martina, that sounds amazing. <laughs> you know, I want to be your agent. Who knows, right? Yeah, Life is unpredictable. Know. Uh, somebody from Azerbaijan. Too. <laughs> I would love it if somebody from Azerbaijan. <laughs> um, so let's talk about real estate. Can we talk openly like that you, you know, purchased, have gotten yourself an apartment. You bought a, a house recently too. Yeah. So you've been, you know, these are like American dreams, quintessentials. You know, you get yourself a house, you live in work continue working hard get a family that's like the kind of the pretty picture everybody wants when they come so you already got you know you bought a, a place in brooklyn uh got a place upstate new york uh, a house like a summer house these are you know not little th- achievements and uh, you keep you're like 30 31 i'm sorry given we're like this the same age but like this is like something great uh, people dream to have these kind of things uh, or they don't yeah, they cannot even imagine that this is possible, especially people even here, people who live in New York who don't do anything. Right. We know a lot of especially people who were born here. They don't realize the opportunities they have around them. You met those people. I'm not yeah. trying to shit on anybody. I'm not yeah. saying Americans are stupid, but it's eight million, eight and a half million people on this island. Not all of them are, you know, w- w- work at Wall Street or like, you know, have uh, own anything really. Um, so they, a lot of them are prisoners to debt and credit cards and they kind of don't know how to navigate this crazy place yeah. because New York can make a bum out of you or it can make you v- empowered and very strong and powerful. Like, you know, that's not a joke. This is not an exaggeration. You go to Brighton Beach. Oh, uh, this is my funny story. The first thing I've ever heard in, in America, when I first came to America, it was my first day. I was like, oh, let me just take a walk around. And I, and I uh, landed at uh, Sheepshead Bay near, near Brighton Beach, right? So it's like, so I walk down the street and there's this guy stops me and says, hey, uh, excuse me, не дашь мне рубля? He asked me for a ru- rubble. A rubble, rubble. Yeah, exactly. So I was like shocked. Where did I fucking come? So this guy came here, God knows when, how, you know, maybe a bunch of bad things happened to him. I don't want to like shit on him, right? Bums, like some of them have, whatever. My point is like, I don't know what happened to him, but the point is, you know, this place uh, he did it to himself or this place did it to himself. You have to be very careful with your decisions and you have to be, you know, this place is really rough and tough. Now, tell me how did you get to the place where you are? And I think it's uh, you got really uh, pretty deep into real estate. How's that working? How did you get into it? Do you like it? Do you not? Yeah. So I run a real estate team, actually. <clears throat> My business partner is in Bulgaria. He's also Bulgarian. He's there now. Uh, so we run the real estate team together. We have five agents on it. I'm recruiting somebody else soon. So we have six. We have, you know, an, uh, an assistant to the team. She's my executive ass- assistant as well. Um, so what, how it happened to me? I was really, I was trying to make a living in, uh, in, with just journalism at the time. I have been fired by every single job I, as a bartender, actually, after my, uh, sales experience, sales associate. I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to start working for tips because I'm going to make more money. So I bartended for three and a half years and I've been, I've been fired by every single job, but one, because I don't really do well with authority as maybe your uh, viewers and listeners already <laughs> have an idea of. Yeah. So, um, so, so yeah, I was at a point that I was very, I was broke. I was, uh, just finished a relationship that was very, you know, toxic and emotionally consuming and my mom has always been telling me like you should do real estate you're going to be great at it so uh, at that point I was like you know what I just got fired by this job again so I might as well start and try and I got into it like took me three months to close my first deal but then it kind of like was a snowball effect I got a bunch of exclusive buildings to rent and um, 
and yeah, and then, you know, I started, I needed people to, to work with me because I had too much business for me to handle. So I started mentoring agents and uh, then I, you know, I didn't want to throw my money for rent. And uh, the thing is I got these 12 exclusive buildings and then I lost them. So when I lost them, and that, that's the funny thing about life, that sometimes the worst things that happen to us are, you know, the biggest blessings. So when I lost them, because I was too comfortable, I was like, you know what, I'm going to get into sales. And then you have to practice what you preach and it's easier to sell something if you're already a buyer. If not, it's not very trustworthy. And I found that there are neighborhoods where it's actually cheaper to to uh, to rent than to uh, to own than to rent. So I located which these neighborhoods were, and I actually ended up uh, the place that I bought. Um, I got some money from my mom. You know, that's the thing. That's what I also specialize in buying without money. Because with money, everybody can. But with without money or with somebody else's money, you know, for trying to find funding, I think that makes it even more fun. Um, and yeah, I just didn't want to pay rent. And my mortgage and maintenance are actually like fourteen fifty, which you can't get anything for rent right now. And I have like a garage for a hundred bucks. And I was like, you know, I really kind of leveraged that. So like, okay, I got this, this good deal for me. And then this is what I can do for you. And then I also think that it's, uh, I also love to sell in Brooklyn and like areas that are not that, expensive because I feel everybody wants to be like luxury real estate broker I like to say that I like selling the hood because um it's it's more of a mindset it's not that much of a money situation because you can buy things with 3.6 percent there is like grants towards closing costs like there's FHA loans like if 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 there is a will there is a way right that's what that's what we say so I think it's good and I love um also, you know, because a lot of times when you're an artist, you got to work these shitty restaurant jobs. And I love, I feel that that's like kind of empowering the community. So actually a good friend of mine, she's a real estate broker in Bulgaria. And um, I connected my friend and her girlfriend and her, her boyfriend, sorry, um, to her. Uh, she's a, she's the front man of a golf band and she's a dancer and an actress and stuff. I was like, listen, you don't have to go dance in the Chauga clubs you know, you can make much more money selling real estate. And I love to recruit also people who come from the restaurant business or other jobs that are not that high paid. And you could really show them that, uh, you know, with, with a hustle, you, you can, you know, there's a lot of money to be made here. And I feel like we as immigrants really do see that opportunity because we didn't have that in Bulgaria. Like I feel that in Bulgaria, when you're a woman, a lot of times you got to be somebody's daughter or somebody's mistress to, to make it somewhere. Um, or get really lucky. I feel the only, you know, I, I work for Bulgarian media because I'm here and they have, they need a person here, not because, you know, and because I do my job well and I also, I, it's important to present yourself. So when you go and you ask uh, and you're like, hey, do you need somebody? And you ask them 10 times, then, you know, the 10th time probably they'll say yes. Like I like to say, what is, what is sales? Do you want to buy that? No. 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 Do you want to buy that? Yes. So, you know, um, I I love when I help people purchase something. And then, you know, we've been seeing very high levels of appreciation in New York, like some areas like Bushwick appreciated 50% on a year over year. And there's still pockets of opportunities like that. So when I manage to land something like that to my clients and, you know, they end up buying something, it ends up being cheaper than renting and they don't have to throw you know, like their money to um, to rent and pay their landlord's mortgage rather than that they pay their own. I think that's something very empowering. And I love I love doing that. So that's why I love my job and also, you know, help people um, make it in this business. Like I hired a lot of like, I was training a lot of agents. Now I only train like kind of like selected if somebody's recommended to me because it's a lot of work. Uh, but I, I think it's very, it's, it's a very fulfilling job and it's very free job and it's, you know, you make your own time and you make your own schedule and you get to meet with people and you get to develop relationships with people. And it's, it's really, it's really, it's really cool. Like real estate's awesome in New York and it's been, it's COVID proof because the market's insane right now in Brooklyn, like some neighborhoods like Clinton Hill, for example, they haven't seen, they didn't see no drop during COVID. And they just kept going up. I, I Which is where we're on the border of Clinton Hill. It's next yeah. next block is Clinton Hill. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I had buyers that they're actually closing with me next week, something on Putnam Avenue. And uh, there was a co-op in Clinton Hill. And there was a huge demand for like two bedrooms under 
a million. So this place changed hands three times, went like a hundred thousand dollars like over us. Yeah, co-op, yeah. even you know, co-ops, yeah. you know, co-ops are very restrictive. Went two times it changed hands until you know they the contract was signed by the buyers, the sellers would return the check and just go with the higher offer. And that happened like three times and you know, went way, way above ask. So um it's it's an interesting it's an interesting profession. Like my background's in journalism, but I have to tell you that right now I uh maybe I enjoy real estate more. I mean, you know, journalism is also becoming a little restrictive right now, which I I have uh, issues with. Ideological. It goes against my ide- ideological views about freedom. So but I like entertainment journalism. So hopefully, you know, soon I'll have the chance to to get back to the red carpets. I used to do a lot of like red carpet interviews, like uh You interviewed what, Ryan Reynolds once, right? Ryan Reynolds, <laughs> Liam Nielsen, um Julian Moore. I asked Julian Moore what kind of books she likes and she just kept going for like two minutes. It was really cool. Uh yeah, well, I used to do like Tribeca Film Fest, Fashion Week. It's the first year I'm not gonna do Fashion Week right now because their policies go against my views. Uh, but you know, hopefully things will change. I, I like to always stay very positive and I think that through even the grimest things, we can always it's our choice how we're gonna look into things. And you know, we have, as you said in the preacher that you said. It's we we are given here the right of free will and it's up to us. So um, and in this country, I feel that a lot of people have problems from not having problems because oh, yeah. we don't have I feel in Eastern Europe, we didn't really have time to get depressed because we Correct. had to deal with, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of issues on, on daily basis. And here people have too much time on their hands and especially now with COVID. When people are not, your mind is not occupied <clears throat> and you're not working on something, regardless if it's like, you know, physical work or whatever, you know, satisfies you. Because, you know, there are people that they love being a driver and you can't tell these people, oh, that's a shitty job, you know, why are you a driver? That's his job. Maybe he loves that, you know? Somebody maybe wants, loves to be a minor and that's their, that's their thing, like. Yeah, I feel like, uh, and I don't want to be insensitive. Uh, you can be insensitive. Let's be, be insensitive, insensitive. Let's please. Be insensitive. But. I still would say that, you know, it's a touchy subject that I do have respect for. Um, but there's something to it that the most uh, depressed countries are uh, the most successful. And we're talking about U.S. and uh, Scandinavia and Japan, which is the highest uh, suicide rates in all those countries. And uh, that's par- that's a paradox. And it's very ironic. Why is that? I, I don't have an answer. So I'm not qualified to even like, talk go too deep in it just because i don't know but there's something to it and it might have to it might have a connection to what you just said where it's a first world problems like we call them like kind of they're not really problems like oh what am i gonna eat today are we ordering food oh my god like where you know i was listening to yon me park uh podcast she's been doing rounds on rogan and lex friedman and She's like this uh, survivor from North Korea, you know, and she, yeah, she's insane story, just insane. And where she said she never knew what it means to, she never knew capabilities of her stomach. When can she be full? She doesn't know what it means to be full all her life because she, you are always in a state of hunger. So her being kids, she would talk about, I would, I can eat hundred breads. And her sister would be, I can eat a million breads because she doesn't know what it means to be full. She thinks she can eat hundred breads, like piece of bread, right? That's like insane. Even to me, like, and to you probably, we lived, we grew up not in that kind of environment. We grew up like, yeah, post Soviet, post, you know, communist, like this weird, tough nineties, but it was never any, anything close to that. Hunger is, you know, the lowest of the low. Uh, and, uh, you know, technically we live in a society where we beat the chain, uh, um, uh, what's the, the food chain uh, battle. Like that's the world we live in. Like I look at us, at the humanity as throughout, you know, thousands of years we've been struggling and trying to beat the game. You know, it's kind of like a video game. You're trying to survive. You're like, all right, uh, this crazy animals are getting, you know, and eating my family. So I got to build a house. Now I can have a, a house. Oh, they break down my house because it's made out of, uh, you know, Sienna. I don't know. And then, oh, I can build a, a metal door so nobody can come. And we keep, we kept growing. We built cities. We built all this uh, infrastructure and we kind of beat the game. We don't have to hunt to eat. 
We can just go, we can have a schedule when to eat. That was never a thing, right? You just ate as you went along. Now I can have a breakfast, I can have a little croissant, I can have a little coffee and lunch and order stuff. That's a very luxurious life. So now you have time to, you know, think about what's my next problem? What's the meaning of life? What should I dedicate my life to? And, you know, like places that are ultimately, the ultimate utopias, which doesn't really exist, but we can say that America and probably, you know, the Scandinavian countries, maybe Japan, are kind of the closest to utopia we have right now. Um, they have these first world problems that are not real problems because people don't really have problems and they invent them. That, that American craving for totalitarian and, you know, restrictive communism to me is very insane. Um, and and I think that it's when you don't know what to do, people instead of just going all out or just being on social media trying to distract themselves, it's you gotta start looking into yourself. So maybe, you know, I think practice like meditation and I started going to sensory deprivation tanks wow. actually recently. And um not recently, a few months ago. I always wanted to try. It's awesome. Um, it's awesome. I, I really like my friend Alan. I don't know if you know him, Alan Medvinsky. Mm -mm. He, he, I think he told me about it. And then I got a, um, my, my Geraldine, I believe from from my team. Uh, she got she got me a present uh, to go together to a sensory deprivation tank. And it's really awesome. Like you know, you go in this perfect darkness where they have some stars up, and you just float for an hour, and you get to like ask questions and just quiet your mind. And um, that really gives you a direction because if you don't have a direction, if you don't have a plan, if you're just like just throwing around, don't know like, what you want to do, then there is no way to achieve happiness and if success or like anything. You don't have to be like, I mean, I am a pretty driven person. Not everybody has to be like me, you know, like I haven't, they would just say eat it. I'm like, oh, I haven't even eaten today because I've just been running around and working and I have clients that I sent right now by themselves to go look at places that I'm like, and, just and it's constantly. already 3 p.m. Yeah, it's almost like at the end of the work day and it's weekend that I'm working. And we say that we, when you work for yourself, you work 80 hours a week so you can avoid working 40. Yeah, you true. Know? Yeah. Uh, but I like to start my day, for example, with like um, like a morning routine and like a little like I love to do this like five minute love and kindness meditation when you like emit feelings of love and kindness to people that you love and then slowly to people that have, you know, hurt you and stuff, which is very, um, it's difficult, but it's very, you know, uh, helpful. The sets long up your run. day also yeah and they nice. know affirmations and when you do something you need to know your why and i feel in my business because you now in real estate like sky's the limit you can make zero you can make a million dollars like it's it's really up to you it's like uh it's like the wild west you know i mean it's licensed here you have to be licensed of course like a member of certain you know i'm a member of real estate board of new york and they have like a code of ethics and all these things and you know long island board of realtors as well uh, but still, it's it's up to you. So if you don't wake up in the morning, like nobody, it's not like you go there and you're like, oh, I have to push like five or ten hours so I can get my daily rate. Like you don't wait to be fed. Having a direction and finding your direction, finding your why, why you're doing things, and especially if you're doing a hustle, like you know, when you're working by yourself and you you know you don't really have a stable income if you don't know why you're waking up and why you're doing 20 hours of your day or 15 hours of your day or eight hours of your day you know just doing that rather than you know going and doing something you enjoy then um you know you you don't really have a you're not really going to do it and you're not really going to be successful and that's why like real estate has 86 percent dropout rate in the first uh i think six months that's the statistics and I, I just, I love being challenged. Like for me, it's like, oh, challenge, bring it on. Because I think like things like that really build us and build our spirit and build who we are and uh, help us be the best version of ourselves. And that's always been my goal. I just want to be, you know, we have limited time on that world and we're locked in this imperfect bodies and situations that sort of sometimes are out of our control or we think they're out of control. And just like, as you said, I like to also look at life as a video game and then, you know, you manage to recreate yourself in the version and the person you want to be and surround yourself with people who 
feel, you know, or your match. And, you know, it's so uh, it's wonderful. Like l- life is the most ex- exciting or it should be the most exciting and interesting journey. So I am just sad that in this country there are so many people who are, you know, so depressed and have like mental issues and stuff like that. And I wish that more of them would baby go maybe send them to bulgaria or to azerbaijan with 200 dollars a month for six months and then they'll come back and they'll kiss the soil under their feet and be like thank god you know so i think that you know sometimes too much creates creates people losing direction and losing something to um to have you, I don't know what's the word, but like it's important to have your roots somewhere or mm-hmm. know. Right, Even right, if right. you're a nomad and stuff, just so you know where you know. Yeah. Where you're coming from. If uh, somebody wants to join real estate, if you had to give uh, uh, like a one advice or something that they should have, what would it be? Have a smile and have um, you know you gotta always put the client on the first place. So I think a great book to start with is like, as, as much as it is a cliche, but it's an amazing book and it's proven itself to be one. It's like Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. So you generally need to make it all about the buyer or the client and just really, you know, some some brokers are like, oh, I'm so amazing and I'm so this and I'm so that. And then people really get annoyed by that because nobody really cares about you in this situation. They care about, you know, you got to be in service for their needs. And sometimes when people are difficult, you just have to like, remember you got to provide the service and just like be honest and trustworthy. And I think that comes when you're a person with like integrity. And for me, like things like that are very high on my, you know, moral scale and stuff. So this, and also like, you know, you you have to put the work, like you can't wake up at two o'clock, hang over and expect you're going to close deals. Like, yeah, you can make your own schedule. We can take days off, but you got to have, uh, a drive you have to have a why why you're doing it uh also you think you have a you should have a good mentor so that's why i, I mean maybe me maybe somebody else but it's good to have a mentor somebody and surround yourself with people who have already done that so then you know you can uh be there and you know i i, I like when you know you're can speak to anybody like i love to sell i i sell two million dollar properties i sell two hundred thousand dollar you know, HDFC income restricted properties. I rent in the Bronx for thirteen hundred. I rent for ten thousand in the city. Like I, I think it's interesting, and for me as a writer, this gives me um, you know a lot of fulfill fulfillment from meeting interesting people. That's a great way uh, to finish up our podcast. Martina, have fun at the show tonight. Thank you. Yeah, it's gonna be a cool <laughs> show. Um, and you can guys follow me on Instagram, NYC Martina. And if someone, anybody wants to be my agent, wants to publish my book or learn more about it, contact me. I'll put all the links below awesome. any or whatever is like the website and then like the uh, uh, where you write the blog, where you cover shows. I don't know if you want to tag that, your Instagram and stuff. So you guys can find it. In or the... if you want to buy real estate. Or, Absolutely. You know, Here is well, a woman that wears uh, many hats, right? <laughs> for but sure. anyway, thanks so much for having thanks me. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Do свидания, Martina. Do vision, do sledge, Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you.